Well, Jennifer said in her introduction that would be difficult to watch, and it certainly was. It was my second time watching it, and it still uh, impacted me uh, tremendously. Um, but it's an important uh, video for, I think, everybody to see. Um, so I thank you for coming and spending the time and uh, watching this and uh, for staying for this panel uh, with two very distinguished guests that we have here. Before I introduce them, I wanted to share a few of my own thoughts um, on this issue. What ISIS has done to the Yazidi community and other minority uh, religions, uh, and especially the women, as we have just seen, uh, this is part of a broader plan to establish control, and I think that point was made in the documentary. It's a humanitarian crisis of enormous proportions, and the international community must act. But the international community has to understand that uh, this is part of the larger ISIS strategy, and I think that needs to inspire us to develop our own long-term plan for defeating ISIS. This documentary is a reminder, if we needed any, about the need to prioritize the defeat of ISIS. I also want to draw some comparisons between ISIS strategy and that which the Taliban pursued when they consolidated control over Afghanistan in the late 1990s. Um, Afghanistan is an issue I spent a lot of my time on. Um, and the Taliban repression of women and girls uh, helped create this same sense of fear in the population and elicit compliance from the population. And of course, the Taliban did not institute the kind of horrendous sexual slavery that we have just witnessed, but their tactics were similar, and the women bore the brunt of their push to gain power. Uh, now what we see is the Taliban and al-Qaeda sort of competing with ISIS for ideological influence in different parts of the world, particularly in South Asia. Um, and we've seen that militants in Afghanistan, particularly in Nangarhar province, that have pledged allegiance to ISIS um, are now forcing girls, uh, they're forbidding them from going to school, which is the same thing that, of course, the Taliban did 15 years ago. So this film shows us the horrors that extremist Islamists are capable of perpetrating. Now, of course, several Muslim clerics have denounced ISIS for trying to justify sexual slavery through religious text. But still, the reprehensible and extreme behavior that we have just witnessed uh, reminds us of the importance of US involvement in this part of the world uh, to encourage the development of civil societies and to increase participation by women in the political and economic lives of these countries. So here to discuss the film, uh, we have two uh, very well-renowned and highly respect, uh, respected women. Uh, first, we have Ms. Bayan Sami abdul Rahman. Uh, she is the Kurdis Kurdistan Regional Government Representative to the United States. Uh, the KRG, as it's called, seeks to build a federal, pluralistic, democratic, and united Iraq. Representative Rahman works to strengthen ties between the KRG and the U.S. on a range of issues, including encouraging investment, which is important to the revival and stability of Kurdistan and Iraq as a whole. Prior to her appointment as the KRG representative, Ms. Rahman was the high representative to the United Kingdom. And before that, she worked as a journalist for 17 years at British newspapers, including The Observer and The Financial Times. Her late father, Sami Abdul Rahman, was a veteran of the Kurdish movement. And he uh, joined the Kurd Kurdistan Democratic Party in 1963 and played a critical role in the Kurdish and Iraqi opposition to Saddam Hussein's regime. Sami Abdul Rahman was killed alongside his elder son, Salah, and 96 others in a twin suicide bombing in 2004. Ms. Rahman was born in Baghdad, and her family briefly lived in Iran in the mid-1970s before moving to Britain in 1976. She's a history graduate from London University. And to my far left, uh, Ms. Nina Shea directs the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute. 
Uh, Mache was appointed by the U.S. House of Representatives to serve seven terms as a commissioner for the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. She also has been appointed as a U.S. delegate to the United Nations Human Rights Body by both Republican and Democratic administrations, and she served as a member of the Clinton administration's Advisory Committee on Religious Freedom Abroad. She played a leading role in building grassroots support for the adoption of the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998. And in 2014, she initiated and helped lead a coalition of hundreds of prominent American religious leaders to issue the Pledge of Solidarity for persecuted Iraqi, Syrian, and Egyptian Christians and other minorities. She has authored and co-edited uh, several reports on the Saudi state educational materials uh, promoting extremist views, and she's also the co-author of two books, Silenced, How Apostasy and Blasphemy Codes Are Choking Freedom Worldwide, and Persecuted, The Global Assault on Christians. So without further ado, let me hand the floor over to our two experts. Okay, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'd like to thank the Heritage Foundation for organizing this event and for inviting me to participate. If I may, I would like to recognize uh, some members of the audience, uh, Mr. Salem Jum Khudr and his delegation, who are sitting in the second row. They are a delegation representing the Shabak minority, another ethno-religious minority in Iraq, uh, Mr. Salem is a member of the Iraqi parliament representing the Shabak. And uh, the Shabak minority, like the Christians, Yazidis and others, have also suffered under ISIS. So it's very apt that the delegation is able to join us today. With regards to this film, like you, this is the second time that I watch it and it's very painful to watch but it's also, I think, obligatory to watch so that we know what our fellow human beings are suffering and enduring right now as we speak, as we sit here. There are people who are enslaved by ISIS. I'd like to just give out some figures, if I may. The Kurdistan regional government is caring for a total of 1.8 million people who have fed, fled the violence in Iraq and Syria. That number comprises internally displaced people from Iraq, including Christians, Yazidis, and Shabaks, as well as Syrian refugees. This has meant that there's been a 30% increase in Kurdistan's population in a very short period of time. This is putting immense pressure on services and on the host community. Yet the people of Kurdistan have welcomed the Christians, Yazidis, Turkmen, Shabaks, and other minorities, as well as the Sunni and Shia Arabs who have fled ISIS. What we are seeing today under ISIS is genocide. We should not be afraid of using that word. Politicians worldwide, unfortunately, are afraid of this because genocide has legal implications for governments, for all of us. But we should call a spade a spade. When genocide is committed, we are obliged to take steps to prevent it. We are obliged to help the victims and the survivors. I'm delighted that this morning I was participating at the conference uh, organized by In Defense of Christianity. And Congressman Thorn Fort Fortenberry and Eshu have co-sponsored a resolution in Congress calling for the recognition of the genocide against the Yazidis, Christians, and other minorities. I think this is a very significant step. Recognition of genocide is one step towards the healing process for the victims, but they also need justice, compensation, and punishment for the perpetrators. So, with regards to the minorities in Iraq, I'm just going to focus on the Yazidis, Christians, and Shabaks. It's estimated that there are five or six hundred Yazidis in Iraq, 
about 400,000 of them are being sheltered by the KRG. More than 3,000 Yazidi women and girls were taken by ISIS and have been held or sold into slavery. More than 2,600 men and boys were also taken. Many are thought to be used as slave labor, whereas we know that the women are being used as sexual slaves. Some Yazidi children, at least 30, but the number could be much greater, are being indoctrinated to become the next generation of ISIS terrorists. Over 2,100 Yazidis have been rescued from ISIS. On August the 16th, 2014, the Yazidi village of Kojo was attacked by ISIS. 459 people were killed. Seven mass graves have been found in and around Kojo. If this isn't genocide, then really, I don't know why we bother to have international treaties and conventions. Regarding the Christians, an estimated 125,000 Christians fled their homes in Mosul and the surrounding Nineveh province, which ISIS occupied in the summer of 2014. All 35,000 Christians in the city of Mosul fled, and it is thought that for the first time in two millennia, no Christian mass is held in Mosul. ISIS gave the Christians a choice of converting to Islam, paying a severe tax, or death. Prior to 2003, the Christian population of Iraq is thought to have been as high as 1.4 million. Today, their numbers are between 300,000 and 450,000. Moving on to the Shabaks. The Shabak are an ethno-religious minority who number about 400,000 in all of Iraq. About 80% of them are taking refuge in Kurdistan. Currently, 56 of their villages in Nineveh and around Mosul are under ISIS control. I think these figures reveal a horrific picture of what's happening. It is genocide and it's incumbent on all of us to do something about this. I'm delighted, as I said, that there is going to be a resolution in Congress, but we need much more than that. The Kurdistan regional government has been collecting testimony and evidence from the Yazidis in particular, but also from the Christians. We are storing this evidence, partly as part of a truth and reconciliation process. I think hearing the truth is really important when we have these atrocities. But also maybe, and hopefully one day, there will be some sort of ju judicial process whereby ISIS and their leaders and their funders and donors will be held to account. We are told that it's difficult for the ICC, the International Criminal Court, to be involved because Iraq is not a signatory, is not a member of the ICC. But we know that ISIS has drawn membership from around the world. There are American members, there are British, German, Tunisians, many members of ISIS from various countries. Could not those countries bring the situation to the ICC's attention? Could not the United Nations take a step to recognize the genocide and to call for a judicial process to take place. What we need today, speaking on behalf of the Kurdistan regional government, is your support. As I said earlier, we're taking care of 1.8 million refugees and displaced people. They are facing destitution. They are facing disease. The United Nations in June appealed once again to raise $500 million for the six months from June to December 2015. So far, it's only raised about $200 million, far short of what it needs. So the UN is having to shut down some of its support for the healthcare services that we provide, and it's reducing the food basket to the refugees and IDPs. I was in Kurdistan just... Uh, 10 days ago, 
And I was told that actually the displaced people and the refugees who are in the camps are better off than the displaced who are not in camps. At least those in camps are in an organized, contained situation. We can have head counts. We can study the demographics, how many children, how many elderly. But there are many who have been absorbed by, the majority in fact, do not live in camps. They have been absorbed by the community. Some are living in half-finished buildings. Some are living on the roadside. Others who are better off have jobs as waiters, as teachers, have been absorbed by the community. But they're all running out of money. Many of them don't make it to hospitals. 60% of displaced children aren't in school. That is a ticking time bomb. What if they miss one more year of school and another after that? This is why I'm saying that we need your help. We need your assistance with the humanitarian situation in Kurdistan. The Kurdistan regional government just cannot cope with this alone. A 30% increase in our population at a time where our, when our economy is facing severe difficulties, when we are fighting a very expensive war. So I appeal to all of you to do whatever you can to send medicine, to raise funds, to organize church meetings, to talk to your congressmen or representatives, to do whatever you can to help the refugees and IDPs. With regards to the Yazidis bringing us back to this film, the Kurdistan regional government is doing, is doing its best. We have a rescue program. Unfortunately, the rescue program needs money, which we don't have. We uh, have rescued many Yazidi women and children and some men, but the program needs more funding. It's a dangerous situation for the rescuers and for the people who are being rescued. The KRG has also established uh, counseling centers, particularly for the women and girls who have escaped. But frankly speaking, this is something new for us. Mental health is not really something that we're very good at. We need assistance to help the people who've been traumatized, not just the Yazidis, others as well. So there are many, many ways that you can all help. And my office, the Kurdistan Regional Government Representation in Washington can provide you with information on how to do that. Once again, I would like to thank you and the Heritage Foundation for hosting this event and for allowing me the opportunity to speak here. Well, thank you very much for those remarks. Uh, Nina? Yes, thank you, Lisa. And I also want to thank the Heritage Foundation and to say what an honor it is to be on this panel with Madam Representative uh, from Kurdistan. And um, uh, we should all be grateful to the KRG for um, giving sanctuary immediately to the various uh, religious minorities that fled ISIS um, last summer and have sheltered them ever since. So thank you for that. Um, I, I want to echo also um, the sentiments expressed already and to say that this is a genocide. It is, is a religious genocide. It is uh, directed against um, the various religious groups that do not conform to ISIS vision of um, Sunni Islam. The uh, Yazidis have borne the brunt of this with the slavery um, and um, the, the film today was extremely moving. I had also seen it before, but it uh, brought tears to my eyes once again. Um, and um, other groups, as well as Yazidis, um, are not exempt from the slavery, although, this, like I said, there are many more Yazidis um, enslaved, Yazidi women and girls, than the other groups. Um, the Christians, for example, the people of the book, um, ISIS has um, issued fatwas, a list of rules and um, uh, definitions. And they talk about this sebeya, the, the, uh, those captured in battle, um, who are people of the books, and this would apply to Christians, as well as to those who predate Islam, such as the uh, Yazidis and other groups, um, can be taken as slaves for sexual abuse. Um, this uh, is 
uh, continuing. There are not only uh, uh, th about 3,000, I guess, um, Yazidi uh, um, women and girls still enslaved, uh, captured. Um, the, there are several uh, Christian women that we know by name, uh, Rama, Rita, uh, Rana, Rita, and Christina. Christina's only three. Um, there's also uh, Christians who are in Syria who are now being captured. It continues to this day. There was a group of 205 uh, who were captured in March from the Kabor River Valley who remain um, captives of ISIS. They said they belong to us now. They're asking to, to try to sell them back to their community. Um, there are um, 260 Christians um, who were taken from a place near Homs in, uh, in Syria in last month. And um, that was the place in Karatain that it also a fifth century monastery was bulldozed then. So this continues. Um, ISIS has praised um, precedents for this in Islam. Um, they have also uh, praised um, Boko Haram for, for taking Christians. Um, they have, uh, in their own country, as sexual slaves. Um, they um, have li issued pricing lists um, for both Yazidis and Christians. They're the same price for sale. Um, that starts with the most valuable, and that would be um, one to nine-year-old girls um, for about, um, at the time I calculated, it equaled about $172. But really, this is more market-driven, and you see um, uh, women being sold for as little as a pack of cigarettes, according to the UN uh, reporter on this. Um, and this is a Muslim woman, woman herself named Zainab um, Bangura, who is extremely um, thorough in her documentation and incredibly brave for speaking out about this, this practice. Um, the point um, I, I, I like to make about five points, and I'll try to hit them quickly. Um, the, there is a point about jizya, about whether Christians have the option of paying a tax and getting away with this. Of course, the men are, are slaughtered, they're beheaded if they don't convert to Islam. Um, beheaded or crucified or somehow other subject to murder, the women are taken as um, slaves, the children are taken as slaves. Um, but there is this notion that there, you can get out of this if you're a Christian f for ISIS by paying a tax, jizya. In fact, this is um, a bogus uh, kind of arrangement because the tax keeps r rising and um, and the, they eventually cannot pay, and then their property and lives are taken in the end. And it was for this reason that the bishops of Mosul, the Christian bishops of Mosul, together decided that they would not attend a meeting last June, June 14, in 2014, um, to determine ISIS's terms, to hear ISIS's terms for paying the jizya. So they opted instead for their community to go into exile to flee. Um, the, uh, the same thing is happening now in Syria, um, where there's offers of jizya, and the Christians are basically turning it down, and they, they want to flee. Um, the second point I want to make is uh, that this, again, is a religious um, genocide. This is part of genocide. It's religiously motivated. Um, there are theological justifications given for it, um, such as that this will increase the, the um, Muslim population, this will bring the slaves to Islam, this is what ISIS puts out in its propaganda. And um, it it's recently came to light that Baghdadi himself, the head of ISIS, um, um, has... Uh, practice this. He took the only, as a, his personal slave, and serially raped um, uh, Kaya Muller, the only um, American hostage, female hostage, and um, he kept her and, um, and until she died. The Yazidi, a 14-year-old Yazidi girl was chained with her in uh, actually, not his own home, but Abu Sayyaf's home. Abu Sayyaf was the chief financier for financier for ISIS. He was killed in a U.S. airstrike this March. The, the Yazidi girl was freed, 
and she has gone on to tell the, the media, uh, did a CNN interview, um, that Baghdadi himself had raped Kyla uh, in multiple times. Um, this blessed this practice and created a precedent for ISIS that this is not only acceptable behavior, but moral behavior for, uh, for men in the caliphate. Um, this is, ISIS calls it the revival of um, Sabia or revival of sexual slavery, and um, in a way it is. Um, it, every state in the world has um, renounced the practice of chattel slavery. Um, it still goes on, of course. There's um, uh, uh, sex trafficking um, uh, throughout the world including in this country, but it is criminal activity. It happens in the dark recesses of society. And the difference here is that ISIS upholds it and has issued rules, fatwas, from its fatwa department um, governing the practice of this. Um, it, it, it talks about how to dress the slave. Um, she doesn't have to wear shoes. She doesn't have to wear um, um, a headscarf. Um, it it um, talks about who can um, who can have sex with her, um, what to do if you have two sexual slaves who are sisters, um, what if they're um, young girls. Um, none of this is banned; it's just regulated by ISIS, and um, and they um, uh, continue to take new slaves, or they resolve to continue to take um, as long as they capture new, new land, as they, as they capture new land. So these are, um, this is a step beyond um, battlefield rape, which is all too common. Um, this is, the inst again, the institutionalization and, and, and sanctioning of this slavery. Um, they're given as gifts, these slaves. Um, there was a report um, put out by the, uh, the Site Intelligence Report, which is a respected um, group on, that monitors terrorist groups, saying that girls um, were being given as gifts for a Quran recitation uh, contest at Ramadan this last July in, in Raqqa. Um, Another point, it was touched on, on the, in the documentary about women in the Alcansa Brigade. This is the religious police of women, uh, by women, for women, against women, um, that ISIS has started, um, particularly in Syria. Uh, it is said to be led by, uh, by British women. And one is a gal named Sally Jones. And uh, Sally Jones was a punk rock star in a, in, in um, England, from Kent, she um, uh, converted to Islam and married, um, she calls herself um, Uma Hussein. Uh, she married the man, the young man, um, half her age, she's 45, he was 20, who was the computer whiz who was killed uh, just a few weeks ago by a US airstrike. Um, he was the, he's known as the ISIS hacker. Uh, renowned uh, fellow from uh, the UK as well. Uh, Sally Jones had a, has a picture of herself posted on the internet with um, in a non Catholic nun's costume holding an AK, uh, I mean holding a gun. She now has another one with uh, all covered in black as an ISIS um, a woman uh, with, a, with an AK. Um, um, Uma Saif is another um, woman who helped organize uh, the enslavement, the, the practice of slavery for ISIS, and, and personally managed Kyla Mueller's uh, enslavement. She was married to the, um, the financier, Abu Saif. Um, my last point is that, um, that many of the minorities were finding particularly in the Christian uh, community, but also there's evidence of it in the Yazidi community, um, don't want to go back to their homes. They have been so deeply traumatized by what has happened to them. Um, the UN and Amnesty International both reported that uh, the, it was local Iraqi and Syrian men and boys who were the buyers in the slave markets. 
Um, they have seen so their neighbors uh, point out their villages and point out their homes, and they feel uh, frightened, traumatized, embittered, and they don't want to go back. Um, this is happening um, as they lose heart that they will ever be able to go back in the near future. Um, the, our military commanders are saying it's going to take years, a very long time, maybe a generation, before uh, Nineveh can be secured, before ISIS is defeated. Um, some experts are saying ISIS is here to stay in, in certain parts of this, uh, this region. Uh, so, uh, you know, donor fatigue is setting in, winter's coming. Uh, many of the Christians um, we are hearing, and I have a, working with a team now who, um, who are getting the stories of these IDPs in Kurdistan, um, at this very moment, and they are hearing that they dread another winter in um, the, the Kurdish north with uh, living in, um, if they're lucky, in shipping containers. It's very, very difficult. Um, there is, uh, I think it is a positive step that Congress is considering a resolution now, um, defining this situation as genocide. Um, and if never again is the, if the imperative of never again is to have any currency, um, we must do something about it. Uh, I think that some of those who are very desperate to leave, who are um, the most um, traumatized, had the most difficult experiences, should be helped to leave. And I am working at this point to try to. Um, resettle them in places where they can rebuild their lives without fear. We're hearing, um, I also co-chair a, a relief group connected with Kenyon Andrew White that does um, work to educate um, the children of the refugees and IDPs uh, of these minority groups. And we're hearing that um, both in Erbil and uh, Dohuk and in Jordan, and what we're hearing in Jordan is that our families, um, our school children's families, uh, are getting the knock at the door at night by ISIS cells or people who are claiming, claiming to be that, demanding jizya, or their daughters. Um, so uh, this seems like a, um, an un, uh, uh, just an untenable situation. And I think it is an important step to declare this as a genocide. Um, and I think we, it is incumbent on all of us to do something about it. Thank you so much, um, and thank you both for your work on these issues and uh, what you have done to raise the issues before the U.S. Congress. Um, I want to turn to questions. We have about uh, 18 or so minutes uh, for questions. I would just ask that you would wait for the microphone, um, state your name and which organization you're with, and try to keep it to a question if you can. Um, I'm going to uh, call on first my colleague, uh, who is the Director of Foreign Policy and National Security here at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. Steve Butchie, and you may have seen him before on Fox News or CNN or one of the various uh, major news networks talking about ISIS. And I've asked Steve if he would uh, give us his thoughts on the broader threat that ISIS poses. Steve, if you wouldn't mind. There's the microphone. Uh, I have to tell you, this was very difficult to watch, this movie. But if you haven't, the movie was actually being very sensitive to its audience. There's stuff a lot worse than what they portrayed. The New York Times had several stories that went into a lot more horrific detail about what some of these young women are, are going through in this situation. Uh, I spent my whole life as a soldier. I was in a US Army Green Beret. I fought in Latin America, in Africa, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and several other places I can't go into. Uh, I've, I've been in Bosnia. I've, I've seen battlefield rape, as was mentioned. This is way beyond what I saw in those places. Uh, what ISIS is doing is just is the clearest example of genocide that I've ever read or, or seen 
since reading about the Nazis. Uh, anyone who would deny that this is political genocide, religious genocide, social genocide, and clearly sexual genocide is just, it's beyond me how anyone could ever justify saying that it's not. Uh, ISIS is not just a threat to Iraq and Syria. It's not just a threat to the wider Middle Eastern region. It is, it is clearly that. It is a threat to the world at this point. Uh, it deserves a, a worldwide response. Uh, there's a saying in, in the military that you know there are some people that just need to be killed. Uh, you just that you can't negotiate with them, you can't reconcile with them. You just have to eliminate them. ISIS right now, because they're being allowed to stand, they're they're not they have not been blown away by the the international uh, coalition that that's been formed. In the minds of their supporters, they're winning. Just by existing, they're winning. And they continue to recruit. Uh, we saw an example of the kind of people they're recruiting. Uh, these are people with, with sociopathic tendencies who, who think this is all really great fun, that they can do all these things to women and to, to people. They can just walk in their houses and take their, their things. That, to a professional soldier is, is anathema. It's, it's exactly the opposite of what soldiers are supposed to do. Uh, I had the privilege of fighting with and, and having my life protected by the Peshmerga several times. Uh, the fact that the, the Kurdish people are standing between innocence and evil men is what soldiers are supposed to do. There's no reason to ever put on a uniform or pick up a weapon for any reason but that. Uh, and the rest of the world, including my own country here, has been very, very negligent, and I say that in the most charitable way I can put it, at addressing this problem. This is the kind of problem that in past times there would be an international army around this area moving inward to destroy this cancer that is there in the the ground that that uh, ISIS is holding. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little. Uh, this this needs to be dealt with, and it needs to be dealt with soon. The longer we wait, the worse it's going to get, and the the more recruitment they are going to have in that area or, and around the world. Uh, and it's, it needs to be dealt with immediately. Thank you very much, Steve.